Romans chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That, it, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's today's big idea. Here's the big thought for today. Christianity is not an, an, an attempted lifestyle change or even a new philosophy. It is God destroying the old you and building a new creation. Let me say that one more time. Christianity is not an, an, an attempted lifestyle change or even a new philosophy. It is God destroying the old Jew and building a new creation. The early church used different uh, known things. They, they even, um, uh, one, of, uh, one of the early church fathers, Polycarp, when he tried to explain the resurrection, he actually used the example of the mythological phoenix. You know, the phoenix, and it gets destroyed, and then it comes back together again. And there's many early church symbols that they did to, to kind of remind people of life. I think maybe for this, maybe the best example is a butterfly. Because it's really interesting. A caterpillar does not simply grow wings or anything like that. When it makes its chrysalis or its cocoon, it digests itself. So that literally there's a point that you can cut open the chrysalis and just goo will come out. On this, and it's just on the cellular level. There's no bits of anything that makes sense anymore. It has been completely destroyed. And yet, within a matter of time, you have a brand new creation. If any of you have never gotten one of those caterpillar to butterfly uh, little sets, you can, you can find them today and you can watch. You remember watching yours turn into butterflies or moths? And it was, it was kind of cool. One guy, I don't know, he had a bad wing. It didn't quite grow right. But, um, but it's, it's really interesting to see. See, you, with this kit, we just didn't like make little wings and put it on the caterpillar and go, fly, caterpillar, fly. You're now a beautiful butterfly. We didn't do that. Something drastic had to happen. And what the caterpillar was is no longer Christian. This is a good example of our life in Christ. The Bible calls us new creatures or new creations. You know, uh, as pastor here, uh, one of my jobs is, is to look around and go, mm, we need some pointing done here. This could use a lick of paint. Um, oh, are we missing, uh, you know, tiles over here? The Christian life is not where we got a, a new paint job on us. 
The Christian life is, is not cosmetic. The Christian life is not even turning over a new leaf like a reservation. Resolution. The Christian life is when Jesus Christ comes in, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, let me ask you a question. Did God mean that when he write, wrote that? Or maybe did he make a mistake? Maybe what he meant to say is not all things, not old things are passed away, but most old things are passed away. Which one do you think he meant? Some of you are afraid to answer because you might be guilty of something. I get it. Old things are passed away. Now, if you're a little bit older in here, that doesn't mean you specifically. It's talking about the old life. It's, it's gone. It's done. All things are become new. Now, the Bible will later on talk about how even though it's dead, even how the old life is dead, how it seems to, uh, to, to creep its way back in. Um, to give you a little idea, the Roman soldiers were very, very good at torture. Did you know that? They, they loved ways. One of the ways that we can't figure out exactly um, everything about crucifixion is because um, crucifixion was just simply get them on something wooden, make them suffer for a long time and die. That was it. That was the rules. As a matter of fact, some crosses um, uh, had a mercy seat. And the mercy seat was, you know, somebody has no strength to keep on pulling up. So they kind of slide them way up on a little bench and, and get a breath. And then they, they kind of slip off and now they're struggling again. That mercy seat is not mercy. It's just increasing the punishment. It's increasing the problems. But one of the things that the Romans would do to a non-Roman citizen that was caught for murder, one of the ways, now there's many different ways that they would choose to, to punish, but one of the ways is that they would tie the corpse palm to palm, chest to chest, leg to leg, face to face. And they would make you leave and walk in the wilderness with that. And you would be walking with this dead man attached to you. And not only could you obviously not get food, you could not get drink, you could not do these things, but it was designed so that as that corpse began to corrupt, it would also corrupt you. Even though you were alive and that was dead, the corruption of keeping a dead thing on you would cause corruption in you. The Bible also describes that, uh, that uh, for a Christian to live in a sinful life is, um, is putting back on grave clothes. If you need a, a, a new set of clothes, I don't think anybody here is going to go to the graveyard. Try to, you know, Natalio, I don't know if you could use a new suit, but you look like you might. You know, maybe you should look at the obituaries and see if somebody was, you know, about your size. Then go, and if they were buried, you know, dig them up. Then you got, boom, new set of clothes, right? You wouldn't do that for many reasons. But the worst of all, you don't want a corrupt dead man's clothes on you. That's what's going on. That's the reason why we get sucked back into the new life. It's not in us. We actually have to bring something external there. So the big idea is that Christianity is not you changing your lifestyle or it's a, it's a new philosophy of life. It is God literally destroying the old you and building a new creation. Look at verse 15. But not as the offense. So also is the free gift. So it's saying right now that the offense of Adam, sin, is going to be a little bit different than this free gift of grace. Who is affected by sin? Adam's sin. What does the Bible say? You can say it out loud. All. Everybody. 
there was a, uh, an old Roman the theologian named uh, Pelagius. And Pelagius tried to say, yeah, Adam's sin just kind of gave us the choice to do right or wrong. It didn't really bring a sin nature on us. We know that's wrong. Why do we know it's wrong? We see it. Even your darling little Reuben, it's a little pagan. He just hasn't completely shown it yet. But don't worry, as soon as he talks, he's going to figure out how to go, no! A little rebellion is there. For, as, for not as the offense, so also is the free gift. The free gift is different. Just because Christ died does not mean everybody is going to receive this free gift. It's not automatically imputed on everyone. You must receive this gift. It's a gift, but you must receive it. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God by the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So here's the comparison. Adam's sin, once it got imputed into a person, affected everything. So, by the grace of Jesus Christ, when you got saved, His grace is imputed in you, and it affects everything. Do you, get the, do you get what's going on? By one man, Adam, he allowed all who followed him to be under the curse and be under death. Somebody once said, sin is never forced upon us but it is always within easy reach. However, Jesus doesn't give death. He gives eternal life. Verse 16, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift of many offenses unto justification. Now, if you want to know the difference between True salvation and man's religion, here's one of the main things. They make you pay for the free gift. It's annoying. It's annoying when something is available for free that people try to pick you, uh, uh, trick you into paying for it. My kids always got tricked by this. There would be something there, and it would be said, you can get this for free. And my sons would go, hey, Dad, let's do this. It's free. I get a free three issues of this magazine. And I go, it's not free. And then they would say, but it is free. It says it's free. And I'm like, it's not free. Number one, you get to pay for shipping and handling, or whatever handling is. But then you get the free... Three, you get the free three uh, magazines because you also have to buy a year subscription. You know, when people tell you, oh, you know, don't go to Tesco and buy a paracetamol. You can get it for free if you just go to the emergency room, the A&E, you know, and they'll, they'll give it to you there for free. Or you could get your whole medical done for free. What's the problem with that? It's not for free. We pay taxes. And even uh, uh, we, we hold uh, bank sales. We do coffee mornings to try to get the NHS money into the NHS because we realize that it's a finite thing. And, 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 and I'm not attacking it one way or the other. I'm just being honest that, that it is finite. And there is nothing that's free. Nothing. People say, oh, I can't wait. I want to go to university in Scotland because it's free there. Huh. It's not free. It has to be paid by somebody. And false religions will make you pay for this free gift. The Jehovah Witnesses will say, well, if you really are going to be true 
and you're going to make it count, you've got to uh, spend this many hours in learning, and then you've got to go out two by two and, and explain to people how terrible the Trinity is and other things. You've got to bring people into the church. You got and that's and 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 you can't even you can't even uh, take part in communion after until after many 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 decades of service. I agree, sister. The uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Here's grace is free. But the way you get this free grace is you've got to do this. Once you do this, then you can get the free grace. Well, hold on, then it's not free. There are religions that will, uh, the Mormons will kick you out if you don't pay your tithe. They won't allow you to go to, do you realize that in order to be baptized in the Mormon temple, you have to send them financial records to prove that you have tithed 10%? Now, Please tithe 10%. But you're not, that's not going to uh, get you in or get you out here. Okay? And you certainly never send financial records. But that's not free, is it? Think about this. Be on God's side for a moment. How angry must that make God? Imagine, imagine uh, Natalio. Natalio says, hey, Pastor Damien. I've got this wonderful, cool plumbing tool. They're so, so cool. And uh, I want you to give this to Dakota. Just don't tell him it's from me. I go, okay. I go, Dakota, I've got something for you. Um, but before I give it to you, um, I need you to uh, clean the bathroom. I need you to clean the sink. I need you to wash the car. I want you to hoover it out really good. And once you do these things, then I will give you this gift. Would you be a little bit annoyed at that? Yeah. What does that have to do with you? I gave it freely. How dare you put conditions on it? We get upset at lawyers about this, don't we? You know, something tragically happens, so we... Uh, we, we take somebody to court and we, and we win a million dollars. But that rascally lawyer manages us to take a third of it. Now, that's in the contract, so that's a little bit different. But how angry must it make God for when he has offered a, the free gift that religion has said, no, man, you have to pay first. This is why religions are not basically the same. They are not similar at its core. They are only similar if they're not examined. It's like saying, huh. It's like saying cauliflower sausage is just as good as a two kilo T-bone steak. I submit to you it's not. Somebody made for me one time Cauliflower mashed potatoes. And you know how they sold it? It tastes just like real mashed potatoes. I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> Liar. And if you don't know that a plant-based sausage is fundamentally different than a two-kilo steak, I pity your soul. Okay, these things are fundamentally different. Grace is a free gift. Making somebody work for it is not the same as a free gift. Christ's free, free gift, once, rece once received, erases completely all condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When you are truly born again, God never looks at you and says, I don't know, I might change my mind. The Bible says, but the free gift, verse 16, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Receiving his free gift justifies you in his sight. He looks at Hannah and says, Hannah, you know, 
you're justified in my sight. Yes, you might have a problem with this individual, but my grace is going to cover it. He says, Rebecca, I never see you anymore. <laughs> he won't say that because he sees you all the time. But you know, whatever it is, your life is completely covered. That's the reason why we talk about somebody that partakes unworthily is not simply because you've done wrong since the last time you've taken communion. That's not the point. It's who you fundamentally are because you have been justified. That's a legal standing. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace, not just receive grace, an abundance of grace. Do you know the difference? You want to know the difference? It's one of those communion cups of grape juice or a nice tall glass of grape juice. Which one's more abundant? Yeah, it's not just a taster. It's getting a drink from the fire hydrant safely. You know, it is, it's abundant. And of the gift of righteousness shall... What's that next word? Rain. Do you get that? The abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. Not because of you, but because of him. It's the changed life. When Adam sinned, did that fundamentally change mankind? Yes. As a matter of fact, um, they were walking around stark naked, weren't they? And they had no problem with it. By the way, they, they were married. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but even then, they, they, they had no problem with it. As soon as they had sinned, their eyes were open and they realized, we're stark naked. When did this happen? I know. Let's find some coarse fig leaves and make clothes out of them. Terrible, terrible idea. And then, and then God comes along, and he's like playing hide-and-go-seek with, with a three-year-old. I love playing hide-and-go-seek with Dakota. Because I go, Dakota, where are you? I can't see you. And he's hiding just behind the curtains, and it's shaking and everything like that. Oh, where, oh, where is Dakota? Right? When God called out for Adam, Adam, where are you? He knew exactly where it was. It wasn't a mystery. But Adam was hiding because of sin, and this whole thing needed to be exposed. Here, here, here I am, God. Why are you hiding? I'm naked, or was naked, but I know I'm still kind of naked. Who told you you were naked? I know I didn't. The only thing I told you was a problem is not to eat of the fruit. Did you eat of the fruit? <laughs> really, it's because of the woman, by the way, that you gave me. If I can just bring that up right now. And the woman is like, well, the serpent. The serpent was like, no, he didn't know what to say. He just got cursed. But Adam's sin fundamentally changed everything, not just in him, but in everybody after that. God was right. In the day that he sinned, he would surely die. And spiritually, he was dead as a doornail. And because we're so fleshy, we go, oh, okay, so we didn't die right away. No, the only real part about you is your spirit. We're walking around in a meat locker. All it's doing is encasing who we really are. This is not who I am. And just like Adam's sin fundamentally changed every individual, the grace of Jesus will fundamentally change you at your spiritual DNA because it guarantees righteousness. Why? Just because we're going to start doing good? No, because he's changed our spirit. 
before was sin, now is righteousness. I, again, think about in your own life. Even when you want to sin and you do it, immediately what do you want? You want righteousness. You can't walk in sin. You can't stay in sin. I say this over and over and over again because it's so true. We cannot walk in darkness. It's not who we are. And if you go, well, actually I can, then I need to say something. You are not born again. Well, how dare you say that? I said the prayer. Well, there's the problem. Where was the repentance? Where was the humility in coming to God? Verse 19, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came, upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came unto all men, unto justification of life. Just like every individual that Adam's sin affected, Judgment came. And so every individual that has received the gift of grace through Jesus Christ, justification comes. And Christian, I want you to start celebrating this. We've got our friend Lena um, visiting again. She just came back from Russia yesterday. And uh, normally she comes to church. She just has a uh, conference call that she can go to. But she says, she said this to us last night. And by the way, I don't know about you. I don't even have to start talking about religious stuff with lost people. They just talk to me. And she says, she says, there's a, and I love her. I do. I love her. She said, she says, I was in Russia and we went to the Orthodox churches. And I see the difference between them and you. I'm like, yeah, we don't have big churches. No, we don't. <laughs> she says, she says, they'll talk to you about Jesus dying for you, and therefore you need to suffer. And therefore you need to give all the time, and you need to keep your head down, and you need to be miserable and always feeling bad about you. She says, but in your church, you talk about sin, but you talk about forgiveness. You mentioned that, that Christianity, when salvation comes, that you have joy, that you have happiness. Just there's, there's something different between you two. Do, do you get that? Christian, I want you to know when I'm done preaching, I never want you to be like, a, oh, woe is me, I'm terrible. Let me go crack open a Guinness and then I'll feel better about myself. I don't want you to do that. I want you to realize who you really are in Christ. And if you have failed in an area of your Christian life, stop tripping over your bottom lip. Oh, it bugs me. It bugs me. When something happened 18 years ago, and six, and yeah, will you forgive me? Yes, absolutely. Then you're like, every five years, somebody brings it up again. What are you doing? Do we just want to re, uh, revisit this misery? Look, it was terrible. I'm sorry. Can we, will you please forgive me? Oh, yes, of course I forgive you. Then stop bringing it up. Because what's the purpose? To make you feel miserable. God does not mention these things to make you feel miserable. He's mentioning these things so that you will realize that you have a changed life. It's kind of like uh, getting an, an inheritance. And then somebody comes to you and says, by the way, congratulations on that four billion pounds that you got. I'm just wondering, why are you still eating out of trash cans? Because I promise you there's better tasting stuff out there. And it's not served in a brown wrapper at a drive-thru. And that's not to make the person feel guilty that they're eating out of a trash can. It's to make them understand, you don't need to do this. 
Live it up, man. Verse 18. Excuse me. Um, Adam's uh, curse, verse 18, guarantees judgment. But Jesus' salvation guarantees eternal life. Why? Because we've been justified. That means legally we have been declared just, innocent. And it's not because God just got a, a, a poor memory on this. He knows all. And by the way, he's buried your sins in the depths of the sea. He separated them as far as the east is from the west, which is pretty cool if you think about it. Because if you go 18 miles east and you take one inch to the west, the east and west are pretty close together, right? Whenever I think about that, that he's separated as far as the east and west, I, uh, the only thing I could imagine is it's got to keep on going doesn't stop. It's just always separating. I love that. And so when you are declared justified, you're brought to trial and Satan says, see, he did this, 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 this. Jesus Christ says, actually, none of that stuff is available. We have no record of it because my blood has covered it. God says, innocent. We are covered. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, again, we're going back to Adam and Jesus, Adam and Jesus. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Many were made sinners. By the way, we were sinners. If you're lost, you are a sinner. And no amount of good deeds will ever change that. Christian, you are not a sinner. That's who you were. And no amount of bad deeds will change that. That is no longer you. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, many shall be made righteous. If you're born again, you are righteous. And no deed, no action will ever change that. For, and look, I'll be honest with you. I've, I can preach this in church and some people go, Pastor, be careful. We've got, we've got children in here, and they might get the idea that because they're saved, they can do anything they want. Let me tell you something. Ready? If they are born again, they have the Spirit of Christ inside of them. And that's going to be the deciding factor. They need to be aware of who they are in Christ. It's like a, you know, me announcing to church, hey, we just got another cat. Cool, can we see it? I bring it out, it goes, whack, 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 whack. Um, <clears throat> Pastor, that's it's not a cat. Oh, it sure is. Look at the ears it has. And it has a little, little, little cat ears on it. It's got a little bracelet on it. Kind of like those, uh, I don't know if you saw those arms for chickens. They have arms for chickens now, just to make them feel better about their lives. You might say, but Pastor, Ears on a chicken does not make it a cat. It's still a chicken, just with dodgy ears on it. And no matter how much I demand that you accept that this chicken is a cat, it's not going to change fundamentally who it is. If you are a Christian, you are a Christian. That's who you fundamentally are. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, Grace did much more abound. The law does its job. What's the job? What is the job of the law? To expose you. And not only expose you, but expose God. What does the Ten Commandments say? Be holy. Why? Because he's holy. And so when the Ten Commandments are given, do not steal. Why not? Because God's not a thief. Do not murder. Why not? Because God's the giver of life. The law doesn't simply expose who you are. It exposes who God is. And it shows how woefully different the two are. The Bible says that we wouldn't even know what sin was if it wasn't for the law. Forty years ago, there were no laws against internet crime. 
Why not? There's no internet. Al Gore hadn't made it yet. And then when people started using, um, using the internet to do crime, it was perfectly legal. Because it wasn't crime. Why wasn't it crime? Because there was no law. You know the drug meth? Meth was legal for many years. Then they finally had to make laws to say, hold on, this is a dangerous substance. But everybody who did meth, sold meth, made meth before the law, they were innocent concerning that law because the law had not yet come. The law shows. And you might say, but, but that's not right. The, the drug is terrible. Yes, it's terrible. But without a law, it doesn't become illegal. Once the law is there, it exposes what you should have known in the first place. Come on. Do we really need, in our neighborhoods, in our estates, do we really need a speed limit sign of 20 miles per hour? Or should it just be common sense, don't go 90 in a residential area? I mean, that's just common sense, right? If there was no law that said it, I don't think a single one of you would be that stupid to go that fast in a residential area. But why do we put up the law? Because common sense is not common. And you have to put up a law that says, look, though you want to do what you want, this says it's illegal. That's what the law does. That's what God's law does. It shows what we already really know, but it shows in writing where we have failed. God gives the law as proof that no man can earn eternal life. You can't. And God gives, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. God gives grace to prove no man can lose eternal life. His grace can we just stop for a moment and just think how amazing his grace is? Surely John Newton, when he penned the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Surely when, when he was writing that, he might have felt the pain in his leg from when he was a, he was a slave trader. And he was hated among his men. He was one of the cruelest people around. And he fell overboard, and his crew, instead of throwing him a rope, they harpooned him and brought him up that way. And he got gloriously saved, and he wrote this amazing grace. How sweet the sound that somehow it saved a wretch like me. See, that grace covers everything. And that grace might not always make you smile. It might make you stop and say, I am so unworthy of being a recipient of that, but I sure am glad I am. And you might say, I don't understand how God can, can give grace to me. I don't get it either. You know what else? I don't understand how a plane works, but I'm going to be hopping one on next week. And I don't need to know how it works. I just need to trust the pilot and the mechanics. You don't need to know how grace works. You just need to trust the God that's given it in your life. Verse 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Before you had Jesus Christ, sin condemned each one of us to eternal death, eternal damnation. We can't go around that. Before there was Christ, I mean, I, I can't imagine Donna ever doing something bad enough. You know, or, or Isaac, you know, he's almost perfect. Or Kate, you know, these people are, are so close to almost perfection. However, I bet they'll be able to say, actually, I know exactly why. I know the sin that condemned me. And I'm so grateful for his grace that saved me. 
And once you're born again, just like sin condemned you, once you're born again, His grace, grace, unmerited favor. There's an acronym for grace, G-R-A-C-E. Have you, have you ever heard of the word scuba? Do you know scuba is an acronym? S-C-U-B-A, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. S-C-U-B-A. If, you, if you're a Disney fan and you've heard of Epcot, E-P-C-O-T, it was Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. That's what it stood for. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. The riches of God is in your life, not because of you, but because of him. And yes, you fail, but he doesn't. That's the point, believer. That's the point. No matter where your sin abounded, grace will always much more abound. Christ makes us righteous. Christ guarantees we remain righteous by giving us as much grace as we need. Have you ever dealt with a difficult person before? Have you ever been a difficult person before? You know how some people are just extra, right? You know, I, I bet you there's some jobs you do that you're like, this customer doesn't even know what they're doing. What I really want to tell them is blah, 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 blah. But I'm really going to have to show them grace and more grace and more grace. And then four years later, they call you up. Hey, Natalia, you did such a great job. I want to hire you again. And you know, in order to just deal with that person, you've got to just store up that grace, getting ready for them. God does that in your life. He doesn't say, no, I'm done with Dakota. He says, I get to give Dakota more grace. He gives each one of us more grace. Yeah, but I, I've done this wrong thing. Oh, so you need more grace. Now, of course, we're going to find out later, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So don't get any funny ideas because Paul already talks about that. But grace covers. Grace, look what it says. Even, look at 21 carefully. If you have something to underline, draw in, do it. Even so might grace reign. Reign. Who reigns in the United Kingdom? King Charles III. Yeah, but I don't like King Charles III. Too bad. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. It rains. Have you ever been really, really ill, really, really sick? Had, had a bad cold? It's like, I don't want to be sick anymore. I, want, I miss breathing. It was so fun. <sighs> doesn't matter. The cold is raining. You don't have a choice about this. Christian, once you've received the Lord Jesus Christ, it's over. That's the last decision you really will ever make because now his grace reigns. King Grace, anything that you do, grace covers. Like, oh, but I feel so bad. Well, stop doing the wrong thing. But don't worry. Grace even covers that too. What's that song? Grace greater than all our sin. Wonderful grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds my sin and our guilt. Where, grace did, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And Christian, one more thought. Grace will always be greater than your stupidity. Always. Grace will always be greater than not just your mistakes, but your purposes. Grace will always be that thing when you think you're at your lowest point spiritually and then God just blesses you and you're like, I so 
don't know why this is happening because really God should be taking me behind the barn and give me a good old-fashioned whooping. That's, that's an American expression if you don't know that. But his grace, his grace exceeds in everything. Why? Because we have to have it. You might go in outer space. You might say, yeah, but I don't like being dependent upon oxygen. Too bad. You have to in order to survive. Do you get it? When he saved you, he says, not only am I the Lord of your life, but grace is now the king over everything. It's going to reign. Let's pray.